to the Osteoarthritis Action Alliance Lunch and Learn for August 17th, 2016. My name is Kirsten Ambrose and I wanted to thank you all for joining us. I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Tom Trojan. Dr. Trojan is a sports medicine physician on faculty with the Department of Family, Community and Preventive Medicine at Drexel University College of Medicine and he's the director of the Sports Medicine Fellowship Program. He's board certified in sports medicine and family medicine with a special interest in injury prevention, use of sports ultrasound to guide treatment of injuries, and concussion prevention. Dr. Trojan has served as team physician for men's and women's collegiate team sports and is currently the lead physician for Drexel Athletics. Uh, Dr. Trojan is on the board of directors for the American Medical Society of Sports Medicine. He is also chair of the OA Action Lion Steering Committee, so we're especially excited to have him present today on visco supplementation for knee osteoarthritis. Welcome, Dr. Trojan. Thanks. Uh, welcome to everyone. I hope uh, this is uh, educational and uh, I'd be happy to answer questions at the end. We're going to talk about visco supplementation and uh, the indications, controversies, and effectiveness. I want to um, Note that I have uh, no financial disclosures. Um, and I want to thank my co-authors of our paper, our position statement, uh, Andrew Konkoff, Susan Joy, John Hatzenbuehler, Craig Coleman, and Whitney Salisbury. The uh, question really comes up, the um, patient-oriented question is, does patients with uh, knee osteoarthritis does the intervention of visco supplementation injection uh, compared to a placebo or and or an intra-articular steroid injection, do they uh, help uh, patients using the outcome of an individual measure, the OMARAC or the responder rate? So we looked at that and, and we'll get down to that near the end, but I think most of the people on this call or listening to this talk know that osteoarthritis is one of the leading uh, causes of disability in the United States and that it's been ranked in the top 10 of non-communicable diseases uh, for global disability with adjusted life years and an, esti an estimated 27 million adults had uh, osteoarthritis in 2005, um, which the number has gone up. and. Uh, We'll ignore the uh, clone horn. The uh, uh, 26 uh, people who are 26 and older, you know, have a rate of about 5% of osteoarthritis, and but it goes up as people uh, age, and depending on the study, whether it's the Framingham or the Johnson County uh, OA project, uh, the uh, rates vary. And Haynes said that, noted that people over the age of 60, it's very common in 12% of people having uh, knee osteoarthritis. So the impact of osteoarthritis really uh, has been shown to be multifactorial. It uh, decreases physical activity and the sedentary populace, you know, the effects on public health of obesity rates, chronic disease uh, management and health care. Uh, can be very staggering and can be very uh, difficult for people in general. It's not just that aspect, but there are well reaching into work as well, which I'll point out. There is a definite dose response relationship between weight and uh, arthritic uh, pain uh, with uh, causing a decrease in activity and activity levels. Uh, as we look and see the uh, percentage of people with osteoarthritis as the uh, uh, obesity diet, uh, BMI category increases, so does the prevalence of uh, osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is not going to get less. It, it actually is projected by the CDC to become more and more uh, common and more and more of a problem. As you can see, it's a very much a problem in our female um, patients. And this is uh, definitely has an effect um, noted beyond just the workplace, but also in the home. As you can see, our obesity problem in America uh, is not going down. Uh, we're not getting taller, so this increase in BMI that you see is definitely uh, an increase in weight uh, across the populace. One could argue the uh, uselessness of an individual BMI, um, but 
as a population, it's uh, very effective to deal with the variations in muscle size, et cetera. The inactivity um, is seen with uh, OA that people um, who have uh, draw here, that this area here where people have 24% of adults uh, with uh, diagnosed arthritis have physical inactivity, where those who uh, don't have arthritis uh, have a lesser number of uh, physical activity. That OA does affect uh, one's ability. Absenteeism and workers with OA, uh, there's definitely an effect of osteoarthritis even when you control for other uh, problems such as uh, diabetes, et cetera, that in the private sector's employees that with OA have 70% more days of absenteeism. It's not just absenteeism, but presenteeism is a big problem. As we look at this, as OA increases, so severe OA absenteeism uh, increases compared to um, people without OA or with mild OA, and when we look at people with presenteeism, that's being at work despite the fact that you're not able to do all the activities of your job, um, it increases with severe OA. So this has been noted that uh, private sector employers with uh, OA average 63 days of absenteeism versus 37 days among matched controls. And that can be a big uh, effect on the economy and so being able to treat OA and, and uh, take care of health care uh, issues. So a lot of treatments uh, for AA are not really controversial. We know that weight loss and strengthening exercises have been shown to be effective. Uh, there's the Cochrane um, review which said that we shouldn't do any more weight loss uh, effects of weight loss on EOA as it's, uh, there is no, uh, no new evidence that will show that uh, weight loss is not effective. Uh, but what have we seen? We've seen a, a large rise in total knee um, replacements, and so knee replacements have gone up uh, greatly in the last uh, decade, and uh, they do have a problems. They do have uh, costs associated with them. Uh, other things that we can do that uh, might uh, reduce the or delay the uh, knee arthroplasty. And why is it important then to delay knee arthroplasty is that people who are 65 and older have a 1% uh, revision rate, while those under 55 have a 1.8% revision rate, which, you know, when we look at the life expectancy, 1%, when you reach age 45, uh, you have another 33 to 37 years of age, and we already said that uh, females uh, are the most affected or more affected than males with the osteoarthritis. So that's 38 years um, at 45 of age, and that puts you now up into your mid-80s. When you reach 65, that's 20 years of life expectancy because you've out-survived most people, so you're a little more hardy. Um, and that puts you then in this uh, uh, revision rate into the 20% range. This is a graphic showing that uh, over time how those over 65 have a less failure rate, less revision rate than uh, those under the age of 55 years of age. And that has to do with activity level is the one hypothesis. So other treatments that are available that are non-surgical, non-knee uh, replacement. And when you look at NSAIDs, which are commonly used, and when you get into the uh, older age groups, uh, there's a lot of contraindication due to cardiac and uh, GI issues uh, against uh, NSAIDs. So uh, there's been a meta-analysis looking at the visco supplementation. That's what visco means here. Um, and it's not significantly different from the effectiveness from the oral NSAIDs, which are quite beneficial, but it has a safer profile. So what is the visco supplementation? So the hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is a natural compound of synovial fluid. Um, you're re-injecting this uh, hyaluron uh, into the knee to supposedly um, one of the theories is that it lubricates the joint. It seems to get uh, taken up by the uh, cells quickly and then starts to be incorporated into the cell wall as well. Uh, it is a thick 
uh, substance, and that's why I showed this picture here. You get a sense that it's not a like liquid, um, and why people talk about it being a uh, having a lubricant or uh, uh, type effect. It is, does have a mechanical lubricant effect in the knee. The indications for most insurance companies, uh, you need to have documented knee OA, uh, three months of PT and NSAIDs, uh, or, or inability or unable to tolerate the above treatment, and then failed, and a lot of them, you need to have failed aspiration and, and, and interarticular steroid injections. Is it cost effective? And I think that's a big important thing, that uh, there was a study in the uh, medical economics in 2014 which showed that the uh, quality adjusted life years um, comes out to $38,000, which is still below our uh, 50000 threshold that has been that most people uh, judge whether something is cost effective or not. So what is the controversy about visco supplementation? Why do people uh, talk about whether we should use it or not? Well, the uh, AAOS, the American uh, Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, uh, strongly recommended against the use of HA and, uh, and said that they were unable to recommend for or against the use of interarticular steroid. That's what that means, um, describing the data as inconclusive. What our uh, concern at the AMSSM in our uh, statement was that uh, the AOS uh, uh, relied upon uh, a new outcome metric called the Minimal Clinical Imp uh, Important Improvement, which is a wonderful, uh, I think it's a very useful tool, but it's also uh, more on an individual basis and group uh, basis, and has not been shown to um, be uh, helpful for uh, these consensus statements on uh, uh, when you base them on a group data. They, for instance, use the MCI for NSAIDs. They use the change in the Western Ontario uh, McMaster's uh, scale, which is a very common uh, knee function scale of eight uh, for NSAIDs, but for visco supplementation, they decided that they, you needed to reach a 10 used a group effect of 40%, where a lot of times they used uh, 20%. So it seemed that the uh, range, they did note that the uh, visco supplementation did improve people's function, but just not to the uh, threshold that they uh, put there for a meaningful clinical difference. So it's not been validated for uh, group data for clinical decision making, and uh, we felt that uh, there's variations in the uh, individual that were not taken into effect. So the AHRT using a similar, they had a no conclusion could be drawn using a similar technique, um, that there's a large placebo effect from intraarticular injections, which we agree. I think that when you look at studies, it's hard to compare uh, NSAIDs to, which is an oral medication, to an injection, but over and over, over again, studies have shown that if you poke somebody with a needle, that they become uh, uh, more effective than uh, when you give somebody a pill. And um, we've noted in a paper that we wrote, um, uh, Dr. Beattie and I, on the uh, placebo effect that you give a person a certain color pill that they uh, have more effect than the same medicine in a, in a different color pill. So we used what was called a network meta-analysis. We looked at intraarticular injections of, of hyaluronic acid or visco supplementation versus intraarticular steroids or placebo injections for NEOA. We used the criteria of the uh, OMARAC-GORZI scale, um, and we thought that would be better than looking at the group data. We wanted to look at how did individuals themselves uh, respond to these injections. So it did is it more likely for an individual to improve versus general group uh, means? So the criteria is high improvement in function greater than 50% and absolute change. If that's true, then you have a response. If they did not have that, then they had to meet these criteria for a response or no response. This has uh, been shown uh, effective in, uh, 
a useful scale to look at how individuals respond to treatments for NEOA. So we looked on an individual basis using a network meta-analysis, and we found that a 15% uh, greater chance uh, for uh, physical supplementation versus interarticular steroid, and an 11 uh, percent greater chance of achieving the Orsi-Omarac responder rate uh, for uh, the visco supplementation versus placebo. So again, using the network amount of analysis, we showed that um, the visco supplementation was uh, much more likely or more likely uh, than uh, steroid injection uh, than it was for placebo that uh, steroid injection does not give you as good of an effect as the placebo. So people like a number needed to treat, which you don't, you can't use with a network meta-analysis, but our data did show a number needed to treat for viscosupplementation versus steroid was 28 people to get an additional effect of a responder, and the number needed to treat for uh, placebo was 38. So. We noted that by using the uh, ORSI uh, OMARAC responder rate, that there was a benefit to the individual patient um, and uh, that this benefit was uh, useful. We're not saying at all not to use steroid injections. Um, there is some data that shows that there's a uh, short term, one to six weeks, relief, and especially with people with synovitis uh, and other, uh, we were talking about the long-term effects um, of intraarticular steroid uh, compared to fisco supplementation and knee osteoarthritis. We were not able to show a difference between low and, and high molecular weight. I did not, and I had not uh, noted any companies, um, but uh, we did uh, see that there are some papers, this is outside of our uh, uh, position statement, that there are people who have noted that there are certain uh, uh, products that uh, may lead to uh, longer delays to knee replacement when they were treated with uh, these uh, different products. The Suparts and Heiligen are low molecular weight Euflex and orthovisc are high molecular weight uh, products. So again, there they did not notice any difference between high and low molecular weight, uh, which is one of the uh, things that people are interested in. Uh, there has been some study looking at safety that the biologically fermented uh, products uh, do have uh, superior efficacy and less side effects than the non-biologic, but that is one uh, one study, and that was sponsored by one of the companies that are biologic. So I uh, wait to see other uh, treatment responses, and I think something like a Kaiser Permanente or other major uh, uh, company like that that has a lot of insurance data might be able to help us uh, note whether there's a difference between the high and low molecular weight and versus the biologically fermented and uh, um, not uh, and then the other products derived from chicken. Others have agreed with our um, systematic review. Uh, there's been another uh, systematic review of overlapping meta-analysis, and they noted uh, that interarticular steroids were a viable option for knee osteoarthritis, as, as well as in uh, arthritis rheumatology. They noted that visco supplementation. That, uh, they found in their systematic review was an effective treatment for mild to moderate NEOA. When one of the things when you're treating a patient is how do the patients feel about the injection? This is an interesting study where they uh, looked at um, the effects of injection and what people were willing to pay for it after they had gotten the injection. So retrospectively, what would they be willing to pay for that? Um, and that is, uh, in this study, 35 euros for intraarticular steroids and 64 euros for visco supplementation injections. So, I already did that one. I did that. 
So in, uh, one thing that came up that we did not compare on that spin-off of me, um, and I think that's something that patients will be asking about, is platelet-rich plasma injections, which are you uh, draw blood, you spin down and get the platelets uh, in the growth factors uh, in the uh, uh, blood, and then inject those platelet-rich plasma into the knee joint. And that is uh, becoming more and more uh, papers out on that topic. And there has been some uh, current recent papers looking at the uh, comparing HA to PRP. Um, and I think that that uh, needs further evaluation. Uh, and that PRP may be uh, a better um, long-term effects uh, compared to HA. Um, but as of the moment, uh, I'm just mentioning that, and we'll have to wait and see. So in summation, uh, from our standpoint uh, and our paper, uh, we recommended that viscose uh, supplementation injections for uh, Kellen Florence grade 2 and 3 knee OA and those over the age of 60 uh, show moderate quality uh, evidence, and that we suggest um, the use of that treatment. And then for those who are um, under the age of 60, uh, we felt that uh, you could infer that, the, that it would be helpful, that, uh, that we did not see any reason why it may not be beneficial for them as well. There is some evidence that it may be moving towards uh, um, delaying knee replacement, but I think that still uh, needs further determination. So our top three gaps and recommendations, we need to determine the difference between uh, high and low molecular weight, if, uh, if one is better than the other. And then does visco supplementation delay knee replacement, I think is the important aspect. You would have anywhere, would you? And then does oh, injection. Fantastic. Does injection I'm sorry, we're supplementation with knee, uh, with ultrasound to ensure interarticular placement. Uh, does it make a difference whether you use ultrasound to ensure that this viscous supplement, uh, substance that is supposed to be in the knee joint and act as lubricant is in the knee joint? Because one of the things that occurs is that um, you, using the superior lateral approach, it's been noted that it's 95% of the time it gets into the knee joint, but a lot of people still use the anterior, medial, or lateral point approach on the uh, joint line uh, adjacent to the patella, and you have to go through the fat pad, and, and that in cadaver studies has been, and in humans with using fluoroscopy, noted about a 75% success rate. So is some of the data um, of the lack of success because of the ultrasound, uh, lack of ultrasound, and so uh, ensuring placement with ultrasound and visualization of the needle, does that improve people's outcomes? Um, so thank you, and I appreciate it, and uh, I'd be happy to accept questions at this time. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. We had just a little bit of uh, background noise there at the end, so I'd just remind people to mute your lines. And uh, I would like to go on with some questions. We did have one come in while you were speaking, Dr. Trojan, from Ken Long, about the demographic data and disease trends making a very uh, compelling argument for delaying total knee replacement for cost reasons, uh, and uh, as such would be beneficial to get the message to health insurers, many of whom restrict access, and some who have discontinued coverage completely. Do you have any suggestions on how to get insurance to foc insurers to focus on your data? Yeah, I think, you know, the thing of the cost of uh, total knee uh, arthroplasty compared to the treatment for quality-adjusted li uh, life years is still in favor of visco supplementation, and so it's it's just continually putting these papers out. You know, when you have a, a very uh, good organization as the AAOS, who I, I think just uh, missed the mark on the how they approach the data, um, then you run into this problem of, uh, of uh, setting wheels in motion that uh, visco supplementation may not uh, be beneficial. I think we just need to uh, target uh, large organizations that uh, have the data like Kaiser Permanente to look at how effective um, these are. And I think one of the problems is that we as uh, physicians um, 
we do a procedure, we do a treatment, and uh, we quite frequently uh, in practice do not measure things like the, uh, you know, or Elmerac or the uh, responder rate and see how people uh, do. Um, so I think that that's, uh, that's something that uh, would help us as well as we showed that when we do these injections of people and an individual continues to improve and that they do well. Um, the reason, one of the reasons why we did this study was orthopedic surgeons, uh, sports medicine doctors who take care of active people um, kept getting, you know, clinically would note that, well, when I do these visco supplementation injections, people say they work for them and they come back and ask for them again because they helped them and they stayed active. So, you know, that the respond the AOS data didn't support the findings that people had noted clinically. So we wanted to see on an individual basis, you know, when we went in, or is this true or is it not true? Or, and the difference between the fact that AOS said that uh, they found that uh, visco supplementation was better than steroids, but it wasn't good enough to uh, use, but steroids was inclusive. We thought that there was a mixed message there. So, um, and that's the, the problem. Uh, so do you want me to answer, Kirsten, the one question that came in? I see two up here. I saw one. Sure. We noticed the difference between single injection and multi-injection. I, we, we, we don't have enough data. I, that's the problem is that a lot of the uh, data is not out there. And, and uh, um, so these single injections, uh, there's a couple products now out uh, there. I know of two uh, versus the three or five uh, injections. And um, we did not uh, see a difference um, in them because of, not because uh, we didn't look, but because there wasn't enough uh, studies out there to really give us a strong effect. And, and some of the studies were looking at group data versus individual data. Um, the other question was, does uh, AOS respond uh, to our study and position paper? Um, we haven't had heard anything from AOS about our uh, paper, which was published in Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine and the uh, um, British Journal of Sports Medicine. All right. Well, does, uh, if anybody else has any questions, you can type them in. I just had one brief um, question. You put some emphasis on the idea that, you know, rather than looking at groups of people and what those results are, instead looking at the individual. Have you observed any particular characteristics in individuals or degree of severity of OA that tends to respond better? Yeah, I think the people who, uh, you know, develop the problem uh, the problem often you have in office is that people with uh, grade four, which is Kel Kellen Lawrence uh, grade four OA, come into the office expecting you know to uh, save their needs. At that point, it's too late. So uh, most of the effectiveness is in the two three, and I um, and really try to work on them at that point to uh, do multifactorial treatment, which is weight loss um, as well as uh, you know, getting strong, staying active. And the weight loss really this is just a separate philosophy with things, which is uh, I think weight loss and staying active are two separate things and, and needing to emphasize to the patients that weight loss uh, war needs a calorie restriction and, and help with nutrition if they can't do it on their own. And, and, then, ex and then exercise is a... Uh, um, health maintenance problem. So we exercise more to stay fit and cardiovascular health and we restrict calories to lose weight um, because I get a lot of people with OA that uh, feel that they can't um, exercise so they can't lose weight and that we need to kind of work on that as well. And then on the flip side to what you were saying, I think it's important to look at effectiveness of treatments on an individual basis um, and we really should start focusing our research on how does uh, to patient oriented. So, uh, does the pa does a person respond or did they not respond to this treatment? And uh, and 
look away from average means of WOMAC, which will get us statistically significant values, but um, they don't give us an answer on do, do people get better if they do this treatment or not. Thank you. Uh, we did have one more question come in just briefly, though, since we are at our half an hour. I just wanted to give people a, a quick uh, heads up to tune in next month for September 21 with Jackie Whitaker on primary and secondary prevention of pre-radiographic OA. So with that, then our, our last question. Yeah, so we um, so the question was the conclusion that refutes the AOS one. Was there any direct discussion. We did send uh, information to AOS. We also um, stated our concerns with the study, and uh, they said thank you, um, but we're uh, no thank you. So that was the, uh, the comment from AOS. Um, so that's, you know, where we're at. I think that once again, I, I make a plug to anybody who, the people who are listening who are doing, you know, are interested in OA and doing research, really just look at, again, the individual response rates and how do, does somebody respond to a treatment, whether it's weight loss, et cetera, or exercise versus how it changes the WOMAC score and as a mean. So I thank you, everyone, and appreciate you taking the time to listen to my presentation. Thank you. We appreciate it as well. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today, and we'll see you next month.